right, episode 31 of the City Bike Culture. Uh, today, hailing from Wisconsin, but has been a New York City resident for a long time now. Michael Hansen, um, coach of, um, well, lots of things and people, <laughs> lots of teams of people, but I'm gonna share a list of you and that you can add on and we'll talk more about how you got into cycling. But like I said, hailing from Wisconsin, um, kind of transitioned from a career at Wall Street, right, to uh, endurance sports. Now, I think you're, Coaching company is called Endurance Sports. Enhanced Sports. Enhanced Sports, yeah, sorry, yes. Sports, right? Enhanced Sports, thank you. Um, and you are coaching the uh, NYU cycling team, the Columbia cycling team, and also the um, CRC uh, Development Foundation. So right. the CRC is Development Foundation team, which is an under 23 team, yep. I think, officially. Yep. And I think there's more to be listed, but yeah, you can is. add to that list. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, how you got into the sport, how you got into cycling, or doing sports, because I think you were into triathlon quite a bit too. Triathlon for a while, yes, triathlon, yeah. Triathlete even, so um, tell us a little bit. I actually started, uh, started out as a cyclist, um, you know, uh, growing up in the Midwest, uh, we had just unbelievable networks of secondary roads and riding, um, but I probably started cycling when I was about 13 or 14, and, okay. and was that slightly pudgy kid who, you know, back then it was baseball, t-ball, football, flag football. So it was the traditional, uh, you know, Midwestern yeah. uh, sports. And I, I really did, I enjoyed them. I really did love them. Um, you know, I think it was after a, a trip to a family doctor about me becoming more active to, you know, lose a, shed a few pounds here. Uh, my dad, my dad was a big runner at the time, and, and I really wasn't into running. Although I did try cross country. That's you big know. up there too. Yeah, it's very yeah, big. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah, some big uh, cross country yeah. teams here back in Wisconsin, and I, I just kind of gravitated to cycling, and it yeah. really didn't take hold until after I saw the movie Breaking Away. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and you know that's a very classic '80s movie, and, and I saw it when I was younger, and decided right away I wanted to be Dave Stoller and yeah. I wanted to ride my bike and you know saved up bought a used heavy 30 $300 French touring bike yeah rode my bike a couple times and um, like the spring races they have around New York City Madison around the Capitol Square is their regular criterion oh, wow. and, and they, you know they had what was their version of Grant's tune yeah, in the yeah. spring they would have you know, the first capital city race around March 15th, yeah. you know, where it was always cold and miserable. I was surprised you could race that time. It was well, yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's some snow banks left and right. They so. did a lot of early season. Some of the universities had early season, to, you know, kind of training races. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this was probably when I was 14 years old and I entered the race. It was probably 40 degrees, blowing wind. Like I, too, you know, yeah. and, and uh, I got dropped after about five laps and was, was cold, was miserable, couldn't squeeze the brakes, burst into tears, told my dad then and there that I'm retiring. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah, I'm yeah, done yeah, with yeah, this silly yeah. sport. You know, and, and, and my dad kind of, you know, being a, you know, calm guy, you know, he had been my t-ball coach for years and, and anything I would wanted to get into, he kind of took me aside and says, okay, that's fine. but. Let's ask ourselves, did we truly train for this? Yeah. You know, did you just ride around the block a few times or did you truly train? And I'm like, all right, well, maybe I didn't really train much. He's like, so why don't we do this? Why don't we join a cycling club and then try it again at the end of the summer? Yeah. And so he and I both joined. There was a local um, cycling club in Madison, Wisconsin called the Two Tired Wheelmen. Okay. Um, and it was a club where uh, Olympic rider Bob Mianski okay. came out of that club. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, famous riders kind of cycled through that area. Um, that was kind of a hotbed of cycling where a lot of the 7 Eleven riders were yeah. from that Madison, Milwaukee area. Uh, Eric Hyde and the Hyde yeah. family. And so you know, I started cycling and later that year. Met a great group of guys to train with uh, and was. I think at national championships a year later, wow. you know, as a 14 year old. And, uh, and, you know, as they say, the rest is. Is there one more clock? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, the rest is kind of history. It kind of just took off from there. Um, yeah. You know, and, and back then, at that time, you know, it, the, the racing was, was different in that, you know, being a 14 or 15 or 16 year old, 
there were junior races at every event, you know, and, and, and you know, that's, I think, the, the biggest thing kind of facing juniors now is there just isn't... So that I've heard this from frequency. a few of the New Yorkers yeah, too, right? Like yeah. Charlie Eisendorf was yeah, saying, like, back then it was much bigger of a scene. And every kind of single like, race you went to, there was a junior field, there was a, you know, a Cat 1-2, the same thing, but in, and in any of these races, whether it be a small race or some of these bigger races, there'd be 50 to 100 Juniors. I don't think that's up. the difference. Like you go to a crit now in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, they'll have a juniors field, but it's often five. It's, well, that's yeah, riders. yeah. And, like, and like case in point, look at um, like Tour of Somerville. Right. I mean, that that's a huge race that's yeah. been going on for yeah. a long time. And, and you know when when I was back in Wisconsin, you know, and, and racing as a seventeen-year-old, yeah. we would drive. Yeah. Out to New Jersey to do that weekend wow. because yeah. it was three days of racing and it was a huge amount of cash prize money yeah, yeah you know yeah, yeah. and back then you know amateur racing they didn't give out trophies they gave out hard cash and it became our summer jobs yeah. and you know in that particular race in somerville there'd be 125 of the best juniors from around the country lining yeah. up yeah you know i was there with some of the dev team riders two three years ago 22 yeah. riders in the junior race and yeah. you get it at few races around the country still in the, in the junior race but it's more maybe some stage races i remember when i was in arizona like valley of the sun they had a pretty competitive like i want to say 70 80 juniors in the 17 and 18 category but but yeah. those races are certain and, and the numbers are dwindling and then we can talk about the reasons for that but i want to come back a little bit so did you just find the cycling club or like the movie was inspiring but it sounds like wisconsin back then was actually and not, I don't think everybody would necessarily think that was kind of um, there were a lot of cyclists and role models around you that were there doing, were there it were wasn't like oh what is this crazy sport because you would think you out there you Wisconsin's would, it, a role do you yeah. see a cyclist even yeah ever? no you it's it's kind of like if you look at um, 9W now Rockland mm -hmm. County I mean that's the way Wisconsin was in the 80s and 90s lots of secondary roads you would see cyclists mm -hmm. all the time I think I had probably even you know spectated some of the races because they were so popular you know back then you know there were a lot of big weekend or stage races you know we had Super Week which was two yeah. weeks of racing yeah. in July around Milwaukee uh, you know we had our own Memorial Day series uh, down in the um, Davenport, Iowa area. Mm -hmm. um, so any, you know, within two hours of Madison, Wisconsin, you could find a race every weekend, wow. yeah. you know, and, and we would race from March until October, you would do 60 races. And so, you know, Madison was kind of that, that hotbed of kind of athletes in the area. You know, they had one high-end bike store called Yellow Jersey. Okay. Um, Several Olympic riders were sponsored by them. Dave Grills rode on the track, and, and he not only had a high-end shop, uh, but he imported a lot of specialty items, um, San Rancho, Karen bikes. Um, and so that shop kind of became sponsor and host for a lot of the local bike racers. And the Tuchard Wilman was probably the biggest and probably the only true racing club in the area. Milwaukee had a big club. Um, some of the places in Chicago and like that. So there were, you know, instead of having several sub teams, you know, there was each city had one or two big teams. And yeah. there might have been a hundred plus <laughs> racers on that team, you know, 15, 20 juniors. Um, you know, my coach back then who was working with the club was, was an you know, ex-national team rider, mm -hmm. one of three brothers who had gone to the Olympic trials at many times. And, you know, you just had this wealth of cycling knowledge yep. around yep. the Heidens yep. lived yep. in the area. Beth Heiden yep. was a regular on a lot of our rides. Um, you know, uh, Tom Schuler lived in Milwaukee and would ride to Madison often to see us. Andy Hampson was a regular. Mm -hmm person to come through Madison so there was so a I'll lot drop of stuff. some explanation of some of these names I think in any hamster is probably is still pretty well known. I mean, Eric Hayden I think Hayden is probably yeah, pretty yeah. still well known enough and I think I think you could easily google some information some of the other ones I think um, a little less well known nationally today nationwide. Yeah. Um, but I think what you're describing is a hotbed of cycling that it was actually fairly easy to get into yeah. as, a, as a 14 year old yep. um, despite maybe freezing cold temperatures for the first race and all that but you saw other people your age doing it and you got into it and you brought up so many things because that 
but we could have like a whole hour or two now on the Wisconsin but Western cycling right, scene. And I think it's morphed into now you have until Gen Tech Cup and the Tour of America's Dairyland. And I think I'm sure that you have fewer races there too. Yeah, like there yeah. Here, but you still have also in Mercer Davenport, I think they still have a crit they there. Every the, yeah, week they or still two. have a crit down there. And yeah. Um, so, and then there are, like, what is it, the Snake, uh, snake Alley? Snake Alley. Like, yep. so the, Iowa has some of those famous American crits too. And I think the, the American crit scene is still very much alive in the Midwest. Um, and it's maybe still the heart of it to some extent. Um, but that's not really what I'm going to focus on too much, even though I'd love to talk about that. Um, for hours uh, but so you you very quickly actually got into it your dad supported you um you thought he wasn't a cyclist he wasn't cyclist no yeah. you know our dad you know it, it's and i see that a lot in a lot of the juniors on the dev team now is having a supportive parent or dad who's a cyclist in fact mm -hmm. most of the dev team riders have a parent who you know, often comes with us on rides. Yeah. You know, which wow. I think okay. is fantastic, and, yeah. and I think that's a great way that some of these kids are being able to ride or enjoy riding with their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad would come riding with us, but my dad became the, you know, the soccer mom who yeah. would drive yeah. the six or seven of us. He would take vacation time to drive us and wow. do two weeks in Milwaukee with us. Yeah. He would drive us to every race. Um, you know, that's when we were going through our punk rock phase, so he would listen to the punk rock music with us. Yeah, to deal and, with all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, I mean, that obviously, so the combination of that scene and the support in the family, yeah. like, that that made it probably um, fairly, I mean, fairly easy, yeah. but you also put in the work then you really got into. You, you mentioned going to nationals, um, and I don't want to fast forward too much, but um did you kind of follow through then with the juniors and then because often what we see is people get into it as juniors right and you see that two yeah 14 15 16 yeah. 17 18 and then they go to college and then you know life yeah, takes like, over or well, other things true. so they, they yeah. want to go out and have some fun and so do things you know, i you know what, what juniors i um i continued into it well into college uh and, and was racing at a, a very high level you know a cat one cat two um, in fact, even when we were juniors, you know, it was easier to get kind of those upgrade points. And so we were doing junior races in the morning and then the pro one, two races in the afternoon and, and double dipping every weekend. Yep. Um, you know, and, and it went on probably all the way till about my senior year of college and then became that kind of decision point. You know, a couple of my teammates were packing up, moving to California to try and, and continue riding at a higher level, smaller pro teams, you know, and that was something I was definitely looking into. But I had also spent the last, you know, eight or 10 years racing, you know, 50, 60 race days a year, uh, living out of, uh, you know, BW Volkswagens yeah. and, and, uh, uh, and, and had thought that maybe it was time to to, to move on and so I had, I had started applying to business school at the time okay. and my thought process was all right you know if I get into a good business school I'll defer for a year and I'll move to California and I'll race one more, one more year of hardcore racing yeah. Yeah. And, um, and and I had gotten into NYU okay and yeah. told them I was so going to you already had your undergraduate. I'd already, I already okay. had one semester left of my undergrad degree, and gotcha. I had one summer you left of yeah, one UW summer left yeah, University of Wisconsin, yeah, right? University of Wisconsin, and I had one summer left to race, uh, and had negotiated a deferral to start a little bit later so I could have yeah. one more year yeah. just yeah. to really see what happens. And uh, it was probably one of the last races of the summer, a local race to Madison, uh, just north of town. I had gone out there. Um, had won the race, was doing a cool down lap, and it was on a closed course. And uh, late in the day, and apparently a little old lady in a red Chevy Nova had driven onto the course around a barricade. And I was doing a warm down lap with a teammate of mine, and just heard this car accelerating behind me, and looked over just to time to see the red Chevy Nova clip me from behind, from behind, from behind yeah. Because she was driving into a setting sun. Yeah, okay. There was a baby who had just thrown some stuff on the ground in the car. Yeah, she yeah. clipped me, I, it, you know, I went over the hood into the window shield, off the bumper, and uh, spent the next, I think about a week in the hospital yeah. with uh, torn meniscus in my right knee, cut Achilles, you know, and, and uh, 
you know, I, I was amazed, you know, how kind of quick I was able to kind of come back and start riding again. But I was also decided that, all right, that was that was a sign from above. Yeah, it's yeah, time yeah. to yeah. call NYU and tell them I'm gonna. Oh, you gonna be there? I'm next gonna be there. Semester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what, yeah, next year. Yeah, yeah, and, and that. I mean, I think it sounded like you had not 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 like. I think you had said, well, let's commit one more year, but I, you knew that you were going your career path anyway. So, in some ways, it would have just delayed that, that extra step yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you had a really good kind of, you got a lot out of that junior. I mean, it sounds great. The, the van rides, lots of memories, lots of good experiences, race wins. Um, you feel like, I mean, as much as anybody in that, without, you know, again, cycling, it's like you go to the high ranks and then there's very little middle, middle ground right. in terms of, um, well, I mean, there is, right? But it, it's, it's hard to make it work. Um, and it's harder to balance than the amount of training time that you need to put in to be competitive in a lot of even higher level amateur races. And anyway, I don't want to get philosophical there, but you went to business school here at NYU. Yeah. And you've been here ever since. I've been here ever since, exactly. Went to business school. You're proud, I should add, you're a proud Western, I think. Uh, you're, you're usually very happy that I can see the Wisconsin pride in you, and I enjoy that. I have friends <laughs> in Wisconsin there, too. So uh, it's not too hard to tell where he's from, but but he's also now, I think, um, very clearly been in New York City for a long time. And, and like I said, involved in so many uh, of, of the junior development, of the rider yeah, development I got, here. How, but how did you, I got lucky. took over for a while. Yeah, I took, you know, I um, spent about 15 years working on Wall Street. Um, at various banks, met my wife mm -hmm. working on Wall Street. So, you know, there was a, a nice happy ending to the move out east a little earlier than planned. Um, but after a while, you know, uh, I, I started back kind of training and riding myself and, and didn't immediately go back to bike racing. I actually started running just for efficiency of time. Yeah and started doing duathlons run bike run and then someone told me i should take up swimming and try triathlons and that kind of came a natural kind of course and then when that happened i decided you know, i'll start bike racing again too and so you know while i was working i, I all of a sudden you know the athlete me came back out and for a while or before i was married I was really addicted, doing, you know, 30-some events a year between bike racing, triathlons, running races. Um, and then, you know, almost by luck, you know, a few friends of mine asked me to, you know, hey, you know, would you write me a training program? I want to, I want to do this too. And, you know, two became four, became five. And then after a while, I was, I was coaching so many people on the side, yeah. you know, that, that almost like the banking job became a distraction. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, it was, you know, I kind of had bounced, you know, gone to a number of places and it just kind of gotten into this rut where I, I you know, you know, was at a German bank and uh, wasn't enjoying it anymore. You know, my wife was in, in banking and, uh, you know, her, her star was soaring and I was kind of at this plateau and I didn't want to change banks again. And I was getting a little stressed. I was doing more and more coaching and I kind of thought, you know, what if I what if I try that for a year? So you know, this was back in 2005. I asked my wife. I said, you know what? I think I'm, I want to take a sabbatical from work. I want to try coaching. Yeah. You know, take a reset, see what's next. And I did. And you know, that was 16, 17 years ago now that that I uh, kind of stepped away and, and started coaching. And uh, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a long time. That was the so 2005. That was sort of. The peak or the the ending, the the sun was setting on the Armstrong years, but that was a big cycling boom in the U.S. So that probably helped in terms of lots of people like wanting to try this thing out, wanting to try riding, and then did you start your company? With, I started my company then. Yeah, I started my company okay. then, um, and had set it aside a couple times. You know, I had started it and then. Uh, a big training center in Philadelphia, Caden Cycling and Multisport. I don't know if you remember them downtown. Yeah, yeah, they they had had a, a big indoor, and this was kind of when Compu Trainers and the indoor training was taking off. And they had approached me because they were going to open up a, a New York store. Mm. Would I want to run the, the coaching and training there? And I'm like, wow, you know, a, you know, a salary and coaching mm -hmm. and an indoor. So you know, that was a natural yeah. kind of move. And so I kind of shelved my thing for a while. Um, unfortunately, it was right before the financial crisis, and. 
know, being a place that was kind of a destination training center all the way downtown, you know, we kind of relied on that Wall Street crowd to kind of come over and, and buy expensive bikes and pay lots of money for bike fits and, and training. And then when the, the bubble kind of hit, there was kind of a pause, uh, you know, and I, I think they kind of hit the panic button and tried to redefine themselves as more of a pure mainstream bike shop. Mm -hmm. You know, and I went back to my own thing. I did. I took another brief step and went up and was running the endurance program for Asphalt Green okay. for a while. And that's when there was the Af Asphalt Green with uh, cycling team. Um, you know, we, yeah, 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 yeah. There was a, a big Asphalt Green cycling team. We had a a big women's squad there at the time too. I think that women's squad was the one that went on to become City MD. Mm, okay. um, we had a huge triathlon club of 300 plus people. And so we were doing programming out of Asphalt Green for cyclists, for runners, for triathletes. Um, and that's kind of during kind of triathlons. Yeah growth time there yeah. kind of you know mid 2000s yeah. to, to 2015 2014 when i think triathlon numbers kind of peaked before they started kind of coming off a little bit yeah. so i've had a few side things but i've kind of always kind of come back to enjoying you know doing my own thing and uh that's where so i i think i i left asphalt green in 2013 to just go back to my own coaching company uh, and that's about the same time I, I, I almost fell into the NYU job yeah. where a client of mine um, had, had come up to me and said, hey, I was just on campus and there was a sign for uh, looking for a part-time cycling coach. Oh, okay. You know, and didn't you go to NYU? And I said, yeah, I went to NYU. Yeah, so yeah, I called yeah. him up and the, the interview process was, you're an NYU alum? And I'm like, yes, I am. And you coach full time? I'm like, yes, I yeah. do. Fantastic! You're hired, and uh, and you know it was uh, yeah. So you've done that ever since. You said 2013 mm -hmm. that, that area. So all of this sounds like pretty natural trend um, kind of transition to you on um, um, with with some you know changes and difficulties. But I think that's normal when you're in the coaching business. I think it, it's very kind of fluctuating. Um, it is fluctuating. You have to you know, and I I kind of found that you have to you know you know I had to be really nimble and you know if I had just I think decided I was going to be a cycling only coach, you know, going through kind of the peaks and valleys of cycling, else, right? there wouldn't have been enough work, you know, and at the time I was doing cycling and triathlon. When I started coaching, triathlon was probably the bigger part of my business, more triathletes, more triathlon clubs, but as triathlon kind of peaked, cycling came back on. Um, when I was at Asphalt Green, we did a lot of programming for um, some of the large charities for the New York City, you know, training people for New York City Marathon, the charity yeah. teams. Yeah. And I continued with that. Um, and that's a big part of my coaching business now is I work with our four or five different charities for their New York City Marathon program. And that's kind of evolved into working with some of these charities for some of their Ride to Cure programs. Well, yeah, they're the coolest for the rides, right? Do you have that exactly. program in New York? Ex exactly. Exactly. So, well. you know, so that is as kind of that's almost probably forty percent of my business now is working with large charities and their kind of endurance yeah. programming thing, and the rest is kind of, so. The fact that I've been able to kind of almost work year round between the cycling and the triathlon and the fall yeah. marathon season has kept it, you know, kept me really involved and, sure. and actually yeah. very busy. Yeah. Um, so you've seen those fluctuations over the years, and yeah, you have a bite, and I'll, I'll, I'll work more that question out with myself here. But but the and and I don't want to focus just on cycling because, like you said, triathlon spike kind of. And I'm actually it's interesting to me that. You see that the peak of triathlon was already, it's already now five, six years ago. Apparently. Right. For you, um, I would have thought it's still kind of rising, but I, I could see that it's a little bit more stagnating now and maybe going down. But the issue with triathlon, you know, the, and the issue with triathlon is, or was, um, it's an expensive sport. It is. You yeah. know, and yeah. it's he very, cycling, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's very difficult for someone new to enter the market because one, the race fees are, are so high relative to a running race yeah. or a cycling yeah. race. You know, a lot of the races are in more exotic locations, you know, and as 
you know, and, and I almost want to say, you know, the success of Ironman is also, I think, kind of mirrored kind of the death of triathlon because as Ironman gets bigger and bigger, it kind of killed off some of the smaller mom and pop races in the more you could affordable drive location. To maybe more exactly. Closely, yeah. So now you've, you know, and, and you know, you need the bike, the travel, the running gear, the wetsuit, you know, the. Yeah. Three, four, five, six hundred, eight hundred dollar entry fees. Yeah. That really limits how many yeah. events you can yeah, do no, I, a I, year. Once in a while, I look at ah, oh, you know, there's yeah. a triathlon. Maybe yeah. I jump in that one. And if it's Ironman, I know it's going to be. You know, what I go. I mean, even, I, don't, I have to think about it. Yeah. You know, three I mean, times and really. And then I'm like, I know I actually want to train for this. I don't want to just like jump into this. Yeah, and that's really, exactly you know? it. The train, the pool. You know, finding a in, in New York City, it's finding a pool yeah. that you can <laughs> swim in. You know, and so I think that was one of the things where I think once you've done a few Ironman. Races, or kind of like once you've done a few New York City yeah. marathon races, it's kind of like, all right, I've done that. I don't need to do six or seven. You know, when I started triathlon, I was doing seven, eight, nine races a year, but yeah. a lot of them were local races, 40, yeah. 50, 60 dollar entry fees. Now I look at it, you know, one of my favorite races has always been the Philadelphia triathlon, and, okay. and that's two, three hundred dollar entry fee now. For uh, what's for Olympic, distance? that's an Olympic, Olympic. Di yeah, wow. Olympic distance. Wow, so Olympic is like, yeah, that takes you like a couple of hours to complete, sort of, which you know, what, what you can do a flight race that take you a couple of hours to complete and uh, or, or, or longer, and you can do them for 30 40 dollars, right. so yeah, um. That's really interesting. Uh, on the cycling side, like I said, I think you maybe started on the tail end of the, the Armstrong kind right. of uh, Landis, US Postal, a strong American kind of showing. We can talk about the reasons it doesn't matter right now. It, it, the effect for you as a coach was a lot of people got into it. Yeah. And I think you also started then seeing the fate, but unfortunately kind of triathlon picked up at the same time. Yeah, kind of exactly, and picked faded. up the slack there. And, and, how, and where's the state of cycling now, or where has it been over the last years? In, you in know, your opinion, from like maybe the personal coaching, and then also we, we'll talk about the, the collegiate cycling maybe a little separately. I think but, yeah. the cycling has been pretty, in, in terms of participation, I think it's been pretty even keel for the past handful of years. I mean, you know, when I started collegiate cycling coaching 2013, 2014, you know, I think there were more riders involved initially. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of waned a little bit, and I think a lot of you know, you know, what you get with with collegiate cycling, and then the unique thing about collegiate cycling is it's it's not an NCAA sport, right? So it's a club sport, but it's a club sport that has conferences and a season and a race calendar, so it's as close to a varsity sport as you can get. But there are no barriers to entry, so you could be a new rider and decide I want to give this a try, and you know, I think that. Is is unique um, at getting a lot of people into cycling because I think cycle, bike racing itself can be daunting if you don't know the ins and outs of a circuit race. And that's why I think you know, like you're seeing now with these CRCA development races, you know, some instructions on what to do that gets kind of sprinkled down to the collegiate level now, where you have a beginner race that a new Cat Five can do. You know, instead of Cat five four three two one. It's you know D C B A A B elite riders, and the collegiate D riders and intro riders are going to have a race clinic. They're going to have coaches on the course yep. telling you what to do, and that's a great first step for a new rider. Um, the other unique thing about collegiate riding is you get to do all the disciplines on any given weekend. So you're going to have a criterion. You're going to have a road race. You might have an individual time trial. Yep. And you're going to have a team time trial, yep. which I tell these riders, you know, enjoy it because you're not going to do that again unless right. you're in the Tour de France yeah. Yeah. or the Olympics. Oh, and you really, really try to find it. Exactly. Right? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. kind of unique because it's cool. It's very cool. It, it's yeah. amazing how, you know, that's because you get a bunch of the newer D riders creating a four person team and they're working together. Um, I'm good. Uh, and uh, that's the cool thing about it is any given weekend, these kids are doing three to four races, yeah. but three to four very different races. Um, and you, show, you can't find that, you know, in, in no. regular cycling now. So if it's it's a good step if you wanted to learn a little bit more about competitive cycling, collegiate cycling is that great first step um, yeah. to take. And, and I think that's why we've kind of, you saw kind of the numbers kind of wane a little bit. And, and I think that's kind of just natural because 
you know, cycling teams at universities, you know, have to have kind of a strong personality kind of started. You have to have the interest there. Um, and then you need that kind of continuation to follow through, um, you know, uh, in terms of organizing the rides, organizing the groups to get to the races. Um, and I think that's what's great about, you know, not all of the schools and the Eastern Collegiate Conference have coaches, in no, fact, very yeah, few of them right, do. Right. I was gonna say, and I that's think... the unique thing about NYU um, and Columbia, that this right. is part of their budget where, you know, not only am I helping them with their training and teaching them the lingo and, and riding etiquette, but, you know, becoming that dead mother on the weekend who is reminding him to bring a skewer and uh, warm yeah, up clothes. Yeah, everybody's and, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. oh, by the way, no one brought gloves this weekend. I got extra pairs of gloves yeah, because yeah, it's 32 yeah. degrees. Yeah, you know? because, because otherwise you'll get, um, you know, uh, like, I did the same thing when I was I was a grad student, so I was a little bit more of the dad too. And then you know you have I, this was on another team, but you have people that say you know oh it's thirty degrees at eight a.m. and like Las Cruces, you know, uh, for the team time trial. I didn't bring my uh, knee warmers or leg warmers or anything. I'm gonna put my jeans over my chamois. You well, know, to do the team time trial with my jeans on. So, I had, you know, those I kind had of a things. kid one Break year. We did a race in Rutgers after a big snowstorm. Yeah, all right, yeah. so there was about a foot and a half of snow on the infield of the circuit race. We pile out of the van. Those who were racing first had yeah. their kits on, right. and the right. one kid piles out because you're never on time. Exactly, never on time. Exactly. On yeah, time, exactly. Yeah, you just so that, barely get there. Yeah. You know, dressing ahead of time was was kind of key. Mm -hmm. But one kid gets out of the van and, and he's got his cycling shoes on, and, and I kind of say, hey, you know, your race is not for a couple hours. You know, put some some warmer casual shoes on and chill out and he looked at me like i was speaking in a foreign language he's like we were supposed to bring other shoes and i'm like well we're going to be here for eight hours you know unless those are a really comfortable set of cd cycling shoes yeah a spare set of shoes would have been nice but yeah he was fine with the one set he had you may do yeah you get a lot of that um so i think we've naturally transitioned into that you might as well talk about it. so but let's back up a little bit because so I was at Arizona State, I was a graduate student, a different perspective, um, we didn't have a coach, and, and like you said, I think with the cycling clubs, you get the same thing I think in regular cycling clubs too, but the collegiate cycling clubs even more so because of the natural turnover every undergrads every four years, sometimes less, so right, right. You, by the time somebody is developed into a leader of the club, it takes a year or two, right. they're gone a couple of years later, and you sometimes they find a good next person to lead the club a little bit, whatever they call it, president, president or a leader, yeah. 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 Um, but you as a coach, because you're not a varsity team, there's, like I said, it's not an NCAA sport. There are some varsity teams like the Marion University right. and Fort Lewis, Mac Mac Lewis McRae and like Fort Lewis. And, but they're spread over the country. I don't think any of them are in the ECC. I don't think there's a single varsity no, no. team in the ECC. Those are the teams that are sort of run like NCAA programs, right? right? And then they have several full-time staff members and you're not full-time obviously right. right so and, and you have a from what i understand it very clearly like you provide coaching right you're not doing and you, yes you provide den mother and all that those services that you know probably aren't technically they might be part of the job description but but you're not there sitting in an office and and running the meetings and getting people to show up to everything right that's not really part of it. it's sort oh. of part of your job but, <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, but, it, but what you, but i'm saying is like there, nobody's on a contract, nobody's on a scholarship, right, right. nobody's not, on, I mean, and the, 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 if there isn't a strong kind of leadership within the club from the students too, then it's going to be really hard for you to kind of yeah. always, even though it's it's better with a coach and that there is some sort of there's a playbook, mentor, there's, right, and, there's there's a there's playbook a, and that's what we, and we've done. it doesn't done. get reinvented every two or three exactly. years, Exactly, right? and that's, you know, and that's kind of what I saw, because, you know, I've gone through seasons seeing 40 some riders on the Penn State cycling team yeah. with strong leadership and, and then, the ability, five, and then, right? and then five yeah. the next year. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, and that kind of continuity is difficult. And, and that's something I think, you know, having a coach or a manager or something like that it allows it, you know, and I did that my first year because when I started coaching, there wasn't a, a playbook. There wasn't anyone telling me I need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I wrote a race report after our first weekend race, and I just kind of wrote up a little recap. Yeah. Turned it into the person who was who was um, I reported to at NYU, and it got returned with edits on it. There, you know, I didn't have it in the right format. I'm like, I didn't even know there was a format. You know, I didn't you got even the full know. Universe experience. There. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it was yeah, it was yeah, trial yeah. by fire for me to figure out. You know. 
how do you reserve a van? How do I yeah. book hotels yep. for the ho you know for the school? How do I yep. get petty cash? And so yep. we did that first year with with. And there's a ton of paperwork with all there's that, a ton, especially there's universities. A ton, exactly, yeah. it's a ton of yeah. universities. And so we sat down, we wrote a playbook. You know, here's all the forms you're going to need, the appendix. Mm -hmm. Here's how the semesters are yep. broken down. What you do in the fall semester, what you do in the spring. Here's what you do on race day, mm -hmm. and, and it becomes kind of this ever-growing book that you know names phone numbers yep. you know yep. a b c d uh mm -hmm. and it gets kind of handed down between whoever is that captain and in fact you know we've now kind of shared that with columbia so they can kind of have their own playbook too yep. as yep. you know it, it's you know um so that everyone's not starting from ground one and, and i think that's what you've seen now too the the e triple c knowing that there is that kind of change in leadership it became more and more difficult to get schools to sponsor a race weekend yeah i mean i remember yeah. early on going to these fall yeah, meetings yeah. where schools would fight over a given weekend you know right. we both want to do the second weekend in april and right. and the other schools would vote on where do you want right. to go you want to go to penn state yeah. or do you want to go to yukon okay, kind of, yeah thank you um yeah but as schools as those who were educated what you need to do for a given race weekend left the school mm -hmm. it became difficult for newer incoming freshmen to take over the the helm and the e triple c has kind of adopted now their own playbook where mm -hmm. they can step in and they okay we have x courses we already have permits and in fact one weekend probably about five years ago uh one of the schools dropped out they were unable to do the weekend mm -hmm. about a month before the race and they contacted me and said hey does Columbia and NYU want to sponsor a weekend up at Rockland Lake and I'm like yeah. sure but what do we do like nothing yeah. Yeah. you know all you need to do is provide your people yep yeah. marshals volunteers support vehicles we will take care of the permits the yeah. police and everything yeah. we've already got it rubber stamped and it was a fantastic weekend I mean it was it was great I think that's the way to go. Yeah, for, yeah. Um, the e, so the E Triple C um, is the Eastern Collegiate Cycling Conference. Yep. There's like I'm trying to remember ten or so over the country, across the country um, of different sizes and mm -hmm. the different number of schools. The ECC Triple C is probably I say probably a number of at least in, in terms of racers probably the most. Yeah, we are definitely the, yeah, yeah, definitely the definitely biggest, the biggest right? conference. Yeah. I think there's 55 plus schools yeah. with teams ranging from. Yeah. One person yeah. to it goes all know, the way from Maine people. to uh, Maryland, I guess. Probably. Maryland, like for the Pennsylvania, probably yeah, yeah, like yeah, basically all the way out to Shippensburg, Penn State. Yeah. Um, and it's big. I mean, this it is big. big yeah. I think that's why the conference has been able to adopt that model of. I think it's being run sort of by former alum, by yep. alumni now, yep. by yep. former racers, yep. and like uh, again on mostly volunteer positions. Yeah, only volunteer, all volunteer positions. But they've sort of taken over. And if something happens where a club all of a sudden the leadership disappears, they can still run that race, right. right? And I think that's probably a wise move because, I mean, running the races as with students only at, at, at Arizona well, State without that's, a playbook, exactly you know, negotiating the overtime. I was a graduate, police, so I sort of know how to do that, right? But right. if you're if you're a sophomore, junior, like you don't, I mean, the average like right. is, is going to be challenged by that yeah. without really yeah. support or pushing, you know. And I think if you can groom that, yeah. sure, but. Like you said, um, there might be reasons, and a lot of the time it's, it's finances, and dealing with the finances, and then also exactly. getting all the manpower to the yeah. event and all that. Thank you. Um, can I get a cheesecake too? Cheesecake. Um, I'll say. You, yeah. Um, and that's that's a challenge. So so I think the is that same? Yeah, same. The the E Triple C is is doing. It sounds like you're agreeing with that. It's doing. A, yeah, no, I think they're doing a fantastic job. job that they've been able to come in and kind of backstop provide a handbook here's what you need to do um you know and also kind of kind of guide them through you know how much you should be paying for a lot of these things right. because collegiate racing is still you know the entry fees are kept low so everyone mm -hmm. can kind of participate yeah. you know and again that's where you know it, really it amazes important. me the differences among schools and, and i'm kind of amazed at how much support an nyu and a columbia gives their teams yes. compared to some of the bigger sports like schools like a syracuse absolutely you know where you know and i wouldn't call nyu or columbia both sports minded universities uh, where, you know and you know you're not gonna yeah. get you know you know these aren't but 
because I think they are so much in invested in students quality of life yeah. and you know and that's where these club sports come into it becomes a lot of times run by not the athletic department but run by you know student, student life, life or, yeah. organizations yeah. and this is part of that tuition yeah. or fee you yeah. pay is like you know we want to have a, a number of clubs to ensure our students have a variety of options to do outside of the classroom. And cycling yeah. just happened. Cycling, triathlon, both schools have triathlon teams, Great. happen to be one of them. And so both schools pay for the entry fees for the riders, wow. okay. uh, provide transportation wow. in the form of school yeah, yeah, yeah. vehicles. And, and a if, very healthy budget. It is. Yeah. And if overnight uh, hotels are needed, they provide money for the overnight hotels and so I, that's so I'm sure you have to like apply for that that slice of the, the giant pie that you're getting I'm assuming or do you automatically get that but, but I'm assuming there's forms to fill out and all that too there's Just forms to fill out right? it's yeah but, I mean it's but it's there I it's mean there. And of it's course there. these are well-funded schools and I think but in, in some ways you're right that their their vision of seeing this is like part of the college experience and yeah. part of like also Maybe a safe and healthy avenue, you know, avenue for students to do something on the weekend rather right. than you know, right. what else they might be doing. So no, 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 and I, I think it's keeping them busy and occupied and healthy. And, and I think, you know, I think you can see cycling and, and all these sports as like potential dangerous thing that the students are doing on the weekend. But you can also see it as a, as a positive, right? And I yeah. think um, I want to get into a little bit. So you mentioned you, you also took over the Columbia job. How do you get? How do you get into that? Was that like, oh, you're doing a good job with NYU? You because know, it, it, like naturally thinking you'd be like. Well, here's the same guy teaching two rival well, yeah, schools, yeah, yeah, well, right? True, That's true. Like on the, and then, but then it's, it can be a good thing too, right? It, New York it's City interesting is a that small the, space the Columbia thing kind of came out. Columbia had um, some managers over the years. They've actually had some other coaches. Yeah. Um, a lot of the other coaches they've had were maybe much more involved in their own racing careers. Yeah. And, and, the one thing, you know, I think that when I took the NYU job and they were uh, enamored by the fact that I was a full-time coach is they didn't realize, you know, a lot of coaches, part-time coaches don't realize the time involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only is it just the mornings of the week, but come springtime, you know, my wife hates it, yeah. but it's six or seven weekends in a row you're gone. Yeah, so we should, so, the, so the collegiate cycling season, and especially it's more condensed here on the East Coast. Yeah, like, for example, in Arizona, yeah. we, we would have, you know, we would start in January because it's Arizona. Right. You know? <laughs> like with the school beginning of my the semester. My first year was but eight, eight March through it was, yeah, it was uh, eight May. weekends in a row. Right. Like and bam, 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 so bam. and that's all the time. Yeah. eight Saturday, Sundays you're gone, or Friday, yeah. Saturday, Sundays, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, so they have nationals and nationals, like, and exactly. May or something like yeah. that. And yeah. that's, so it's that's very difficult. intense on the East Coast, right? And cold and travel and yeah. Um, and yeah, they usually you leave on a Friday, maybe even earlier than you've gone. Exactly, and, and gone, Sunday, come back yeah, Sunday night Sunday. late. Yeah. And yeah. it's a long weekend. You know, I had, you know, NYU, um, kind of much more of a cautious school than coach. Not only as a coach, but is that travel den mother? You know, NYU. Yeah. You know, they're not allowed to go to the races on their own. Like probably you were at Arizona State or some of the kids yeah, at Penn State, State where they could just yeah, they yeah, could yeah, just yeah. show right. up. Yeah. You know and yeah. you know and, we know and, rules and you know exactly. Yeah, I think there's and, there's you know, pros but, yeah. and cons yeah, yeah, to yeah, both. Yeah. I mean, you, the unique the unique thing that kind of evolved out of with NYU is my teams always having to travel together in mass with yeah. me became very tight knit teams. Yeah, I mean, sure. and, you know, and, and they would do these quirky little awards at the end of the every year, you know, craziest looking kid, yeah, uh, yeah. worst uh, kept secret about an inner school relationship. Okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. there was always, you know, yeah. the closest team. And, you know, NYU was always because, you know, all 15 of my riders, whether you were a D or you were an A, we traveled together. We watched everyone race, we cheered everyone on, we showed up at the same time, we left at the other time, as opposed to, you know, some of the newer riders race earlier in the morning, a lot of the elite riders race early in the afternoon, and yeah. sometimes they won't see each other no, if they're traveling separately. Grid, you don't right. see each other. I mean, to be honest, even at CSCA, right, we race at the same time, right. but, but it's New York City, so you're right to the race, you show up 10 minutes before, mm -hmm. maybe say hi to a few people, and after the race, oftentimes you're cold, and you gotta go, exactly. or you have something else going on with the family, it's really convenient, but it doesn't help build community, right? Mm -hmm. And like someone, some, similar to what you had, I think, as a, as a junior riding long band rides and listening to punk rock, mm -hmm. and you get the same thing. And I think that is what something that collegiate cycling can really offer. Right, and, and I think that was that was kind of unique. And so, um, at the time, I had just started working with 
CRC development team, mm -hmm. and that's when they kind of moved it from a junior team to an under 23 because they were having a hard time, you know, once they classed out of the juniors, yeah. a lot of those younger riders, and several of them um, had gone on to Columbia. Several okay. of the junior riders had gone on to Columbia and were having a hard time finding CRC teams who wanted one, very young riders, or two, riders who were devoted to collegiate racing in the spring and weren't gonna be at the March and April CRCA races. Yeah. So that growth from a junior only team to a CRCA team allowed us to bring in a bunch of the Columbia riders, a right. bunch of the NYU riders early on so they could re race collegially in the spring and then have a CRCA team for the summer. And because of that kind of transition, a couple of the Columbia riders kind of approached me and said, listen, you know, we think it's great how close your team is at NYU, how the fact that you're at every race, and, and I had to kind of break that train of thought and say, you know, I have to be at every race. It's not, not that I don't want yeah, to yeah, be, yeah, 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 yeah. but I have to be there. Yeah. Um, and so they said, you know, I know this is a part-time thing and we're not like true rivals, yeah. you know, but we're in the same conference. Would NYU allow you to coach yeah. Columbia? Because right. I think there's a lot of overlap. You could, you know, you're already at the races. Yep. If you're going to do a strategy meeting for a course, you know, and at yeah. that time I had already started, hey, yeah. Columbia kids, come over. Here's my take right. on what we need to do today. Right. And so... You know, being part time at NYU, they had no problems. Yes. You know, with me yeah. being part time yeah. at, at Columbia, yeah. and for me, it was a greater way to kind of build. You know, you know, with the CRCA guys, you're you're riding with your teams a lot. You're riding with other teams, but a lot of these collegiate riders were new to the city and mm -hmm. didn't have those network of people to train with. And you know, at the time, there might have been you know ten or fifteen active Columbia riders and ten or fifteen. I said, you know, if I can make that into a thirty-person group, where now these riders can text each other and a couple of the NYU riders can go ride with Columbia and just create larger pockets for these guys to ride. I think everyone's going to benefit, sure. you know, and, and and that kind of definitely what has taken over. And then, you know, we started merging the workouts because as we got later in the season, you know, you get eight NYU people showing up at six in the morning and eight Columbia, and, you know, sometimes that might be four. Um, it became real easy to, to merge the races. Um, I'm trying to think if we've ever had a situation in a race where a there's been a break in yeah. NYU, you know, yeah. it's always, we've had different strong riders in different races. You know, we've had some riders on Columbia, work for an NYU rider in the break, and vice versa. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But but you, you might get that it's anyway still, because it people is, like it's still, each exactly. other. It's, it's, it's a very friendly environment. Yeah, you yeah, got yeah. to the point where the last couple of years, particularly 2019, was the last full season we raced. But 18 and 19, you know, we were all staying at the same hotels or Airbnbs. We were going up at the same time. Um, you know. We were, you know, NYU rider for coming home with some of the Columbia riders in the vans and stuff like that. And it became just a much larger, almost, you know, collegiate cycling network. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and that's great, right? Because because they all do live in the same city. And exactly. Yeah, they can ride together after. And, um, probably change the battery here in a second, but I do want to ask you a little bit more of a question. I think more, make a comment maybe more. So the the change to under 23, I think makes a lot of sense for CSCA too. With, with, with juniors, we can talk about that separately too, a little bit disappearing, or they're just not being an help you have a scene anymore at the moment. And we can talk about that yeah. too. That's a separate question still, but to move to under 23 makes a lot of sense because like you said, you can still also ride the collegiate teams. You can ride right. CSCA development team for the rest of the year. And also then, if you graduate by the age of 23, hopefully you have started getting into jobs and making connections and right. feel settled in your city. Or, and that's another thing where I think local teams might be sometimes skeptical taking on younger ones because they know where you're going to go after college or after college. You're right. Going to go on to right. Your, a little bit more, yeah. You're going to go on to a job that somewhere else, right. right? Are you going to be in New York City? And that can be a question where you're like, hmm. Well, I think it's, you know, when we did change it to under 23, you know, there was that drop off in junior participation. I mean, it was hard for a while finding 14, 15, 16 year olds who wanted to race bikes, who had bikes. Right. Um, and having the influx of under 23 riders. And, and the first couple years we did it, uh, you know, we were also surprised of how many riders were riding for other collegiate teams who were from New York. And so at any okay. given time over the summer, 
not only did we have Columbia and NYU riders, but there were a few riders from University of Chicago, Indiana University. Oh, but over the summer they would over be the here. summer they would right. come back they because would be like they were New young, Yorkers. A group of younger riders right. to work with and like to ride with, and that makes a lot of sense. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I think I benefited greatly as a junior riding with older, faster, stronger riders. And I think that kind of mix, you know, it's kind of interesting when my juniors ride with the collegiate riders and the newer collegiate riders are like, how old is that kid? Like he's 15, you know? Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. and yeah. so there becomes that, you know, the strong junior rider hanging or teaching the college kids a few things and vice versa. Uh -huh. You know, you gotta ride with faster riders to get yeah. faster. Yeah. And I think this is kind of a great transition that these junior riders can see what goes on at the collegiate level. Some of them have gone on to college and look for colleges with yeah. cycling well, I think teams. I hear someone have some yeah. conversation about college too, right? And what's that, what's that like? And you know, those, those are good bonding moments maybe too. So. And I think also when you get to those under 23 riders then, they have enough years within the dev team that if they're going to stay in New York, then they've started to make contacts yeah. with some of the other teams. And then yeah. that transition, you know, any given year, we have two or three or four people kind of transitioning out age-wise. And it's kind of like, okay, let's hook you up with some of the, here's, you know, go for a ride with Vaselica, go yeah. for a ride with Dave yeah. Jordan. Yeah. Let's go have you guys go for a ride with this and, and find that next natural fit. And that's like the perfect, that's the role of a development team, right? Yeah. You're like, you're developing them, but then you're also trying to place them somewhere. Or, and like, I think you're right that they've raised the scene a little bit. They've seen other kids and other teams and they've maybe like communicate with a few folks and chatted or had good race experience with them or talked after the race. And then it's easier to find, find the next team if you're staying in the city. I want to use the battery, but I do want to keep uh, talking about that. It's interesting.